My name is Ileana Guinness and I'm an interior architectural designer as well as a PhD candidate within the Health Design Collab at Monash University. Try and imagine how you would do your everyday tasks if you couldn't speak. How would you order your morning coffee? How would you talk to your friends and family about how you feel? Imagine not being included with others all because of your unique barriers to communication. This is a picture of my younger sister, Michelle. She is 16 and has a severe intellectual disability. What I mean by intellectual disability is someone who has a diverse neurological condition that affects the brain and its development, which makes basic everyday tasks such as getting dressed, eating, and even bathing very difficult to do. But it also leads to challenges with speech, language, and communication disability. Therefore, Michelle is unable to speak the way you and I do. Life hasn't been easy for my family. Due to circumstances beyond our control, I became Michelle's primary caregiver when I was only the age of seven. I have since dedicated my life to better understanding her and her every need and desire, which has actually influenced my level of empathy towards her and the 1.2 million people like her worldwide. Over the years, I have witnessed firsthand the challenges Michelle faces in both public and familiar spaces, simply because someone without an intellectual disability is unable to understand the way she communicates and conform to neurotypical forms of communication. When studying interior architecture, actually, I realised architecture doesn't respond to intellectual disability and communication difference and does not even cater for diverse cognition. Over the last few years, doing my honours, I actually realised that architecture is actually exclusive and does not provide processes which encompass new perspectives. I've realised that the nature of architecture is in fact very exclusive. I recognised that the need for my sister and other people to be involved in architectural processes and spaces and the need to respond to their difference. This is where I want to make a change and I want to make it better for nonverbal communicators. But what happens to someone when their communication is not heard, seen, or even understood? People who are nonverbal are excluded from design practice and research. This is problematic as we are denying them the opportunity to participate and show designers how they want space to function for them. In a world though built around neurotypical ways of thinking and communicating, Michelle and the other nonverbal communicators are actually not heard. By not including them in design processes, we actually create for public and private spaces, we are marginalising them and creating barriers to being involved. So what does the problem really look like? Modern day spaces designed for people who are non-verbal are actually labelled as quiet spaces. Quiet spaces were originally designed for someone to retreat when they felt oversensory stimulated or overwhelmed. However, it actually creates segregation between a non-verbal communicator and their community marginalising them even further. Design processes respond to neurotypicality. This means that the methods are actually suited to someone who's atypical, with atypical forms of development. They become inaccessible for someone who is neurodiverse and uses diverse methods of communication. A typical design process relies on meetings between designers and their clients, which is unachievable if you are not a neurotypical communicator. This, therefore, unconsciously develops methods of neuroableism, meaning they have been designed with little to no consideration for minimally verbal or non-verbal people. Prioritising spoken language and atypical forms of development actually leads to exclusion. So what can be done? How can we create spaces for non-verbal communicators that not only assist non-verbal people, but also include them in the process? In order to prove the potential of non-verbal communicators and to create a great solution, I assisted in the development of a home that was designed purely by a group of non-verbal. Kilmixton is a home based within the southeast suburbs of Melbourne. The purpose of the home was the red spot, made for people with disabilities for short-term accommodation. The home required modifications to be made for the unique tailoring of someone who's non-verbal with a neurodiverse perspective. In its current state, the home consisted of a variety of rooms, which actually neglected purposeful design, and they were empty with limited function, therefore limiting to people who are non-verbal and neurodiverse. Being that I'm a disability support worker, I asked a few families to take part in the development of a home to become purposeful for neurodiversity. 
As the home is for nonverbal communicators, it should actually be designed with nonverbal communicators. In order to explore the diversity within nonverbal communication, I decided on a group of participants who use diverse forms of alternative communication methods. The first participant used eye gazing, a form of technology which actually reads their eyes and allows it to work as a mouse, clicking on words that they wish to communicate. The second used object to symbol, using physical objects to express their needs and desires. The third used a visual communication style, which was through images on a keychain, which allowed the participant to express themselves visually. The fourth used receptive language, meaning they had great listening skills and utilised an iPad to create sentences of what they desired. The fifth used behaviour as a form of communication, meaning the use of gestures, which were unique to the individual, and they followed a Makaton language, a communication system which uses simple gestures to communicate what they require. In collaboration, we co-created a home. I developed a profile on each of the users, which allowed me to see their interests, likes and strengths. Then through observation, I explored how each of the nonverbal communicators actually used the space. For instance, the participants would sit on the floor, or they would actually run to the window and tap on it. This allowed me to reconsider the traditional structures of a home and see it through this neurodiverse lens, allowing the nonverbal communicator to actually educate the designer. There were some intimate moments within the design process that actually really resonated with me. One of them involved the participants actually interacting and playing with all these shadows on the walls. The way the sun cast the shadows created a visually pleasing silhouette. The participants were intrigued and they would tap on the windows and observe the shadows. This was clearly important to the user and therefore, as a designer, I made sure that there were the key features and outcomes within the home. I offered material samples to the users and recorded their reactions. How did they place the material across their faces or whether they threw it in the air and pulled on it? These materials were actually purposefully placed within the rooms and their functions. For rooms designed for sensory seeking, materials were harder so that sound can bounce off the walls. And for rooms designed for sensory avoidance, materials were softer and they used low and natural light within the room. Together, we co-created an amazing design process that facilitated actually all the strengths of the users. The designer in the process is simply the facilitator, aiming to encourage diverse communication as well as engagement. The participant's family was also included within the design process to assist in interpretation. For example, a nonverbal communicator would tap on their chest and this would indicate by the family that they are looking for more of something. This was a complex design process that places the nonverbal communicator at its core. Functioning and adapting to these diverse communication methods and enables us to create processes that not only are more inclusive to neurodiversity, but allow us to learn from the unique perspectives of nonverbal users. By breaking down these neurotypical structures, such as specific room functioning, we are able to learn steps towards creating inclusivity for nonverbal communicators and actually inclusivity for all. In order to make processes that include and recognise nonverbal communicators as the narrators of their own experience, we need to develop a framework to include design methods as well as alternative forms of communication and to learn from and include neurodiversity, ensuring that all voices are heard. Just because Michelle can't speak doesn't mean she has nothing to say. Design needs to take responsibility and actually respond to the needs of nonverbal users as well as offering them the opportunity to have a voice. By becoming more curious and empathetic to the needs of others, we're designing for empowerment and inclusion for all. By educating built environment practitioners, I hope to enable them to create and represent nonverbal communicators and encourage complex neurodiverse processes which allow designers to learn from the unique perspectives of nonverbal communicators. It is 2021 and people with intellectual and communication disabilities still can't order a coffee independently and participate in all the things that they enjoy. Let us make communication and representation accessible for all. That is what I want to give my younger sister, Michelle. Thank you. I want to give a special thank you to my younger sister, Michelle, for being my absolute everything, my family, Monash University and TEDx Monash for the opportunity, my amazing speaker buddy, Kim Fernandez-Kemp, 
My PhD supervision, Dr. Chris Cottrell, Dr. Canvan Nayer, and Professor Daphne Flynn, as well as George at Studio Edge for helping me put this together.